Hello everybody and welcome to our first joint uh, annual general meeting for NHS North Cumbria CCG and annual members meeting for North Cumbria Integrated Care NHS Foundation Trust. It's just gone three o'clock, it's the 22nd of October 2020. This is a bit of an experiment, it's the first time that we have done it uh, jointly and it's also the first time that we've done it online. We're like everybody else, we're getting used to doing everything online, so bear with us if we do have any gremlins this afternoon. So normally if you would come to an annual general meeting, you would get the presentations first. We've pre-recorded those and made those available on our website, so you can see them on the North Cumbria Integrated Care website or the CCG website on the usual pages for annual general meeting and they link to each other, so it should be easy to, to see all of the presentations. Hopefully you've had the chance to see those already. We've been asking for pre-submitted questions um, to be sent in. We've had quite a few of those. So we're going to start by taking those pre-submitted questions. Uh, you can also ask questions in the chat box, which is where you would expect to find it usually, bottom right hand corner, just down here. Um, if you would like to put your name, that's fine. If you don't want to, that's fine too. One thing that would be quite useful, there is an option of being able to like a question. So if there's a question that you would like to ask or you were thinking of asking, or you think, oh, that's a good one. If you can like it, that will help us prioritise by going to the most popular questions first. So I will expect everybody on our panel today and uh, in all of our questions to abide by the shared um, values that we have adopted as a health system of kindness, respect, ambition and collaboration. And I will talk for NHS jargon. So we do tend to uh, speak in our own language sometimes in the NHS and I'm as guilty of it as anybody but I will try if anybody slips into it we'll ask them to to kind of go back into plain English if at all possible. I should let everybody know that today's uh, meeting is being recorded and it will be available online afterwards and we're going to have our full hour until four o'clock for uh, questions and answers to any of the issues that have been raised uh, by our annual reports 2019-2020 and any questions that you have for your, your health service locally here in North Cumbria. So I'm going to start by asking um, everybody that's taking part to introduce themselves with their job title so that you know who's going to be responding to questions. So I'm going to start by going to uh, Lynn Simpson first, please. Good afternoon, Lynn Simpson, Chief Exec for North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust. Thanks, Lynn. Michael. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Smiley, Director of Finance, Estates and Digital for North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust. Thank you very much, Michael Smiley. Uh, now we'll move on to Anna Stabler. Anna Stabler, Executive Chief Nurse, North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust. Thanks, Anna. Ramona Dugood. Thank you, Ramona Dugood, Executive Director of Operations at North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust. Thank you, Ramona. Dean Oliver. Oh, Dean, I think you're maybe still on mute. <laughs> That'll be the, the first event Gremlin, today. Gremlins are around. Apologies, my name is Dean Oliver. I'm Executive Director for Performance and Improvement at North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust. Thank you very much, Dean. And Peter Scott. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Peter Scott, the Interim Chair for North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust. That's great, thank you very much Peter. Now I'll move on to the representatives that we have from North Cumbria CCG. So we'll start with our Accountable Officer, Mark. Good afternoon, my name's Mark Adams and I'm the Chief Officer of North Cumbria CCG. Thank you Mark. Uh, the other Peter, Peter Rooney please. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Rooney, I'm Chief Operating Officer for North Cumbria CCG. Thank you, Peter. Charles? Uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Charles Welborn, and I'm the Chief Finance Officer at the CCG. And uh, Helen? Hi everyone, I'm Helen Horton, I'm a Practicing GP and I'm a GP Lead for Commissioning and Pathways with North Cumbria CCG. Thank you, Helen. And finally, John Rush. Hello, everybody. My name's John Rush and I'm the chair of North Cumbria Clinical Commissioning Group and I'm also the chair of North Cumbria Integrated Care Partnership Leaders Board. 
Thank you very much. Hopefully you were able to see everybody as we went round, but as we go to people to answer questions, you'll have more of a chance to, to see everybody's faces as well. Um, John, I'm going to start with you. You mentioned there that you're also the chair of our Integrated Care Partnership, another bit of uh, NHS jargon, but that's just the bit of us that all works together. We've had a, a question from Margaret who says that as we are responsible and accountable and answerable to the Department for Health and Social Care, how are we working together organisationally at the coalface? OK, thank you uh, for the question, Margaret. Just just in care in relation to the integrated care partnership that we operate in North Cumbria, we operate at various levels. We operate what we call integrated care communities across eight geographical areas in the in North Cumbria. And there, what you've got on the ground there, you've got people from the community hospitals, you've got people who are GPs, You've got third sector organisations uh, and also community groups as well. Um, alongside that, you've got the support that we get from social care in terms of adult social care and children's social care. And they work together. So, some of them have got sort of hubs created in those ICCs where they can coordinate some work, but they're very much part of a multidisciplinary team. We, knew, we know we need to work and improve on those things, particularly our links with third sector and community groups, but we are working very much on that. And then in terms of the, the overall integrated care partnership for North Cumbria, um, Lynn, um, obviously from the, from the Hospital Trust, <laughs> Lynn chairs an executive group there and I chair more of the sort of leaders board. Uh, and there we've got members of all those organisations I mentioned before, GPs, third sector. Uh, we've also got the police as well. We've also widened the scope as well in relation to um, universities and also in relation to the local enterprise partnership as well, so that we can look at not only the economic, uh, sorry, not only the care and support that we can provide for people, but also the economic impacts and where we can fit into those situations as well. So it's very much a partnership at different levels and, and we are ultimately part of a wider partnership in the North East and North Cumbria, uh, where we've got an integrated care system and we fit very much in that, in, in that line there. Thank you, John. Whoever said the NHS was easy to understand. Uh, um, and, and also we've, we've had one technical gremlin. We've had me as a gremlin as well. I've missed off uh, Daniel Sheffer. So Daniel, if you'd just like to introduce yourself, because I think there are some questions for you later. Uh, thanks, Julie. Hi, I'm Daniel Sheffer. I'm company secretary at North Cumbria Integrated Care. That's great. Thank you, Daniel. OK, so we, we've done introductions. We're going to make a start through through the questions now. We've had a question from Edward Bebbington um, who has, has described in great detail some of his experience with various ophthalmology units, which sounds like they've been very positive. Thank you, Edward. But the, the question is about accelerating the pace of rollout of telemedicine technologies. Um, he's particularly keen on knowing how it reduces costs, how it frees up clinical efforts and reduces cross infection risks and reduces the deterioration for him of sight between appointments. Um, he's used a, a particularly effective app through the Moorfields Eye Hospital, which looks after some of his care. Um, and he's keen to know what's happening here in North Cumbria. So I think I'll go first of all to um, to the trust and we'll start with Dean first of all, if you can tell us a little bit about how technology is being used. Thanks, thanks Julie that, and, and thanks again to, to, to Edward for that really, really interesting uh, question. Um, as, as an organisation, as a healthcare organisation, clearly the trust is committed uh, to make the most out of digital technology where, where this is in the best interest first and foremost of patient care but also in the interest of the organization um, as well and indeed the recent pandemic that, that we've all been through nationwide has, has really has forced the issue to create additional opportunities to, to look at the digital agenda a lot, a lot more broader uh, and it's really acted as a stimulus to encourage us to look using technology and working differently uh, across the organisation to benefit patient care. I guess, Julie, when we talk about um, technology it, and, and telemedicine, it, it's probably helpful to, to understand what we mean by that. And I think there's there's three key areas where, as a trust, you know, where, wherever possible, we're really keen to extend and expand into. I think the first area is around telehealth. And again, as, as an organisation, we're really majoring on, on that area which is really focusing on the on the on the development of remote consultation in our maternity services we've developed a system of you know, digital midwife system 
which is increasingly beginning to capture information without mums or newborn babies or whatever actually attending clinics in person, being able to use that 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 technology to, to inform how, how treatments and, and, and services are being provided. We're looking to provide increasingly more advice and guidance through our outpatient services and, and increasing the number of outpatient tele follow ups that are being used. You know, clearly when you when you look at the trust being able to to branch increasingly into these areas, it frees up not not just huge amounts of benefits for the patient because the patient clearly doesn't need to spend time traveling, doesn't need to worry about fighting with hospital car parks, uh, doesn't need to worry about cross infection rates and the like. That there's clearly patient benefits to be offered and, and to be received. Um, from the trust point of view, from an efficiency point of view, again clearly we we can start we can look at, at how we can make efficiencies around how we can have increased capacity that we can use and harness and redeploy that capacity in other areas of frontline services, which not only benefits the organisation, but again benefits patient care. I think the second strand that's perhaps worth thinking about is, is telecare within, within the telemedicine area. And this is really in, in the system. I think it's probably been led more by colleagues in adult social services a lot more, but this is really starting to look at remote systems to aid falls alarms, you know, where we have vulnerable elderly folk living potentially on their own out in the community where we have alarms that, that can alert services to, to people if they're in any kind of uh, any any concerns, call systems and, and, and remote support. I think the third area, which we are perhaps not as, 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 as advanced as yet as we would like to be, is probably around telemonitoring. But I think at the moment, I think that that's potentially quite a, a, a highly high cost investment area. And I think there are a number of national pilots at the moment which we are watching with, with great interest to see how those pilots develop, uh, to see actually what, what are the areas that are worth making that, that upfront investment into and where we are likely to get the greatest benefits from the use of, of what is, what's still a you know, very, very scarce resource for us um, within, within the trust. I think other more practical areas where we've again really extended things, you know, again, going back to the, the current pandemic situation, which we're in at the moment, we've tried to use IT and technology to allow patients in our wards to be able to still receive virtual visitors from their loved ones and being able to see, because again, through through the pandemic, visiting, visiting hours have been restricted for obvious reasons. Um, we've also been, we're also really keen to look at the use of virtual at role in virtual visits, particularly across our community services as well, and also looking at the, the, the use of clinical instant message, messaging tools as well through the patient care. So quite a vast array of current arrangements. We are actively looking at expanding and then increasing those in, in any opportunity areas we, have, we can at the moment. And indeed, the Trust has a digital strategy that's really trying to enhance that and take those technologies even, even further forward. And one of the areas, for example, that's being looked at at the moment is around our patient engagement portal, which will, when developed, which will enable you know, enable patients to access their own clinical records, book appointments, have discussions with the clinician. So it's again, really exciting area, really forward looking at the moment and something which I think the trust is certainly really keen to, to embrace when it's in the right the interest for patient care. Thank you, Dean. That's a, a really full response. There's an awful lot of work going on and, and I think like everybody, the NHS is, is kind of playing catch up with how people are using technology more and more nowadays. I'm going to bring in Dr Helen Horton, who as a, a GP, you'll be doing this on the front line day after day, I imagine. Yeah, and I think um, primary care was we, we'd already started embracing some technological solutions um, prior to the pandemic. But as Dean says, the COVID pandemic has sort of um, sped up the process somewhat. So we already had apps for, pa for patient access, the MyGP app where you could book appointments and um, uh, order your own prescriptions and, and that, that was being developed, um, as well as the advice and guidance system which Dean mentioned, which allows communication uh, about questions that primary care has for secondary care. Um, so that dialogue between us helped improve that. Um, and there was a start 
a tentative start with online consulting. But obviously, since the COVID pandemic, that's everything's sped up and, and primary care has changed how it works. And we are going on a much more technological approach. So now people can access primary care through. We have ways of doing video consultations or two way consulting. So patients, we can send texts and patients can respond back to us with photographs, for example, of skin lesions. Um, through a system called AccuRx, which all, is, all practices have now. So, so that's primarily our way of video consulting at the moment. Um, 111 can now directly book or add patients into the GP service for either appointments or for telephone consultations. So if patients contact 111, but it needs a GP, that can be added directly to your own GP. The Great North Care Record is something that's been in development over the last few years, and that's now up and running. So this is a, a way for your uh, the patient record to be shared across the ICS, so the integrated care system, so with the North East, uh, so with the Newcastle hospitals, as well as with North Cumbria. Um, what we also have care homes with iPads, so we can do online consulting uh, out of hours mainly, um, or or for the sort of care home review patients with our care home patients, especially if there's an outbreak, to allow us to still maintain that communication even in the pandemic. Things that are coming, so there's the patient engagement portal part of the Great North Care Record, which is going to allow patients to um, access documents or information from their uh, when they attend across the system and also have a, a bit more of control of their appointments across the whole system. And there's the call first uh, 111 first initiative for A&E, which is coming this winter. So um, patients will be encouraged to call 111 if they've got a, something they may have gone to A&E for, and they'll be given an A&E appointment if appropriate or directed to the most appropriate service. So there's there's a lot of work that was already going, but the COVID pandemic has sort of changed dramatically how we work and sort of pushed that digital agenda quite far forward quite quickly. Thank you very much, Helen. It's just, there's obviously an awful lot going on and, and people are learning very quickly. I suppose it, it raises a question for me about some of the people that might get left behind. So if you can't access technology or if you struggle for many reasons, there will still be the old face to face consultation there for people. That's great. Um, OK, well, we've had a question in the chat box. I'm just going to come back. So um, the question is from Alan who says, if John is the chair of the CCG, which commissions secondary care, how can you justify being on the inside of the trust? So John, if you could just clarify what you meant by the ICP so that we're all clear that you're not on the inside of the trust. No, that's correct. I mean, I, I, the, the ICP is the partnership. The Integrated Care Trust is obviously uh, the organisation run around the hospitals and the community hospitals as well, which is chaired by Peter. Scott and obviously Lynn's the chief executive. So uh, I'm not I'm not involved in the trust other than I have to say is I, I do sit on the trust board at times when it's appropriate for me to sit on the trust board because it's part of the collaborative arrangements. Um, Peter Scott, the chair of the, the trust, comes onto our board as well. There are times where we have to make sure that there, if there are any conflicts of interest that we manage those as well, which we do and we do very well. But yes, that's the only kind of contact I have with the trust is, is actually in terms of some of those board meetings, which are public anyway, to a certain extent. Thank you, John. Uh, it's really helpful. I think it's because we use the word integrated in lots of ways. It's good to show that we're all working together, but we have it in uh, integrated care communities, partnership systems. It's it's all very, very challenging. OK, I'm going to move on to another question. So, so Les Blacklock, who is a, a governor, has asked uh, uh, several questions. I'm going to start with the one which is for North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust first, if that's OK. And it's about the integration and the creation of NCIC. So the trust came into existence on the 1st of October last year by a merger of North Cumbria University Hospitals Trust and Cumbria Partnership Foundation Trust. And Les has, has raised concerns that perhaps the quality of the merger wasn't as good as it could have been and that there have been delays to things, possibly because of the pandemic. But are we sure that staff are being looked after through this process? So I'm going to go, I think, to um, Ramona to answer that question first, please. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Les, for that really important question, particularly now that we've just had one year on from our new organisation uh, coming into to be in. And I think there are a number of points to pick up there from your question around community services, how they sit within the new organisation and how we've supported our staff and teams. 
And I think it's fair to say over the last um, six to eight months in particular, whilst we've also been managing the pandemic, we have been working very hard with our teams to think about what the operating model needs to look like for the new organisation. And some of that has been informed by our learning around where services sit, how they best serve local populations and how we bring teams uh, together across those pathways of care from hospital to community and indeed home. We have made some changes in going into the summer uh, this year around our operating model and that was very much done collectively with our staff uh, teams in terms of how we shape what's called our clinical care groups. So the organisation is, is structured and its functions are set out across four key clinical care groups. So we have one which looks at emergency care and medicine. We have another set around surgery, critical care, cancer and support services. We have one around women's and children, which is a new care group. And we have put in a specific care group around our community and ICCs, integrated care communities as well. And I think that was a really important step for us in terms of recognising the importance around those community services, not just the hospitals, but the broader element of our community services as well. And that has absolutely shaped some real improvements in key services that we're working uh, very hard on now from a very local example in terms of our work with our primary care colleagues, particularly during the, the pandemic and how we've had to really align our workforce, our resources to serve those local populations in a very more innovative and responsive way. I think it's fair to say we've got a lot of building uh, to do on that, uh, taking us forward, but also how we have been working with our colleagues in the third sector and indeed our adult social care partners to really harness those community services uh, across across the whole of the North Cumbria patch. So there's been quite a lot of work in our first year around the mechanics of how we've set up that operating model and the structure in terms of where services best sit, how we support those groups and teams coming together, but also recognising that within that new organisation working in a truly integrated way, it's not just about what we focus on within the organisation, it is about those partnerships arrangements at the local community level and how we really harness them, particularly I have to say with, with primary care. And I think we've got some great examples and I know you did ask in your question a supplementary around how we really are harnessing those community services and have they got an equal voice uh, in the new organisation and very much so our ICCs and community services have absolutely been at the leading edge, particularly in the last six to eight months around taking forward key developments, again supporting some of the changes of working and pathways with the pandemic, but very much working at that local place based integration and really supporting that focus of how we harness the out hospital care model uh, in the future. Thank you very much Ramona. Um, I hope that answered that part of your, your question Les. There is so a couple of questions for the CCG so I'm going to ask Peter Rooney to respond to these if that's okay and they, they relate to the, um, the end of I suppose Cumbria Partnership Foundation Trust when mental health services were transferred to what was Newcastle Tyne and Weir is now Cumbria New, uh, Northumberland Tyne and Weir uh, Trust and, and saying do you think that was the right thing to do was that the only way forward at the time and also a reflection on there's been quite a churn of some of the, the staff and some of the leadership and was that the right thing to do? Thank you for the question Les um, and thank you for the way in which you've been such a a strong and vocal advocate for mental health services in Cumbria for, for a long time. Um, I think we should, should also begin with a huge thank you to all of the staff working in mental health and learning disability services, not, not just in the trust, but in, in partner organisations across the third sector, social care and, and elsewhere. Just by way of background, the clinical commissioning group alongside our partner in Morecambe Bay Clinical Commissioning Group, the, each of the NHS trusts involved and in direct discussion with NHS England and NHS Improvement, all collectively agreed that there would be a, a significant benefit in mental health and learning disability services being delivered in Cumbria by a larger specialist mental health trust that could bring additional clinical capacity additional expertise, additional knowledge and, and indeed where necessary additional resources. 
that was a major drive behind the, the decision. <clears throat> if I think about a, a year on, um, I'm, I'm very strongly of the opinion that it was the right decision to make. <clears throat> Inevitably, when you have an organisational change of this type, there are some challenges and there is still a lot of um, great work left to be done. But by, by way of indication, we've seen very significant reductions in the waiting times for child and adolescent mental health services. We've seen, for example, more children than ever <clears throat> receiving appropriate specialist support for attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Really encouragingly, the, the trust, the CNTW trust in North Cumbria has been able to recruit additional staff, including particularly um, medical leaders, so additional psychiatry staff into posts which had often been long unfilled and vacant. So we are beginning to see some changes in the improvements in the in the local workforce model. And if I reflect just over the, the COVID period, here in North Cumbria, the, the CNTW Trust were able to bring their at scale resources to really support our communities, for example, um, by delivering additional COVID testing in advance of the national testing system being established. Um, they've had a fantastic pastoral support offer, not only to mental health and disability staff, but those working in other sectors, for example, direct support to the care home sector. And the CNTW Trust has been able to maintain all of its services during the COVID period in North Cumbria including through the adoption of, of technologies that were part of the answer to the an earlier question. So I think everyone would acknowledge that there is a long term endeavour to continue to improve mental health and learning disability services here in North Cumbria. But I think there's significant evidence that even over the last year, things have certainly moved in the right direction. Um, I think, Julie, with, with respect to the question about changes in leadership and so on, we would we would all reflect that there's definitely a benefit in having long term stable leadership. Um, I think it, it we should also recognise though that clearly colleagues make their own choices about careers, retirement, the needs of their families and so on. And inevitably there are changes in, in leadership roles, not not only within mental health and disability services, including within my own organisation in CCG as people have, have made other choices. That's that's inevitable. But we do have a, a clear responsibility to provide consistent high quality leadership, not least to maintain the, the morale and confidence of our staff. Peter, thank you very much. Les, I hope that answers your questions. I can see that there are questions coming in the chat box. I'm going to try and speed up a wee bit. One of our pre-submitted questions was from George Butler, who's also a governor who has done some research himself into um, uh, BAME staff, so that's black and minor, uh, minority ethnic staff in positions of authority. And he's wanting to know specifically about the trust. Um, in terms of uh, staff from BAME groups, how many of those do you have at grade seven and above? So those in more leadership positions and how does it compare with some of the national figures if it's not comparing well? And we, we know that Cumbria is a particularly white area. What's the trust doing to address this? So Anna, can I throw that one to you, please? Anna Stabler. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, George, for the question. Um, just to um, outline what the trust does and every other NHS organisation, we each year have to actually complete um, a workforce race equality standard report, which is sent up to the centre on a yearly basis. And within that, it shows the proportions of BAME staff at each grade and each, each level. Um, the total staff within North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust is 5% for BAME. But when we break this down for band seven above, looking at clinical, medical and dental, 15% of those staff are from the BAME group. I think I'd also like to just highlight that the Trust is really keen to encourage BAME leadership within the Trust and over the last year we have been taking some action in this area. For example, we've pr really promoted the National BAME Nursing Leadership Programme 
and um, worked with the North East Regional Group to engage the North East Yorkshire Leadership Academy to introduce these programmes locally, because historically people had to travel down to London. Um, locally, we've had three people undertake this first programme within the first cohort just finishing in April. And over the next two years, the trusts will be building to uh, building on the BAME leadership and progression opportunities, including the inclusive leadership and reviewing of recruitment elements as part of going out to advert. With input from this um, to help staff and structures um, to best suit the organisation and the communities that we serve. So I don't think I would propose to say any more than that, then we would, we really do try to be inclusive from a medical nursing AHP perspective um, within the trust and we really would um, encourage those individuals to come and work in the organisation. Thank you Anna. Daniel, in, in terms of looking at what that means for the board and for governors, how do you try to increase BAME representation there? Uh, thanks Julie. Uh, there, I suppose there are two different, uh, I'll take this in two different parts, uh, one in relation to the governors and then in relation to the board. Uh, our governors at the moment, we currently uh, don't have anyone who's registered with us uh, who has a bit uh, comes from a BAME origin. Uh, and I think what that highlights to us is the need for us to actually look at how do we expand our membership strategy and look for actually getting out and getting into those communities to actually promote the role of governor, the role of being a member of, of NCIC and also how we can help those communities have a voice at the table of the, how decisions are made. Uh, we've just about, we've just going out to election shortly and we're hoping to actually uh, address that position as part of this election and we'll work with our governors in order to uh, develop proposals to reach in those hard to reach communities and using those local voluntary sector organisations that have excellent links into the, our local population. I think in terms of the board membership, very similar to what Anna said before, the NHS has done a huge amount of work uh, over the last uh, few years in terms of increasing diversity in terms of board level appointments. Uh, there's been a, a national challenge set through the Cabinet Office uh, to uh, look at uh, diversity in terms of gender equality on the board. Uh, there's a challenge for the NHS to have a 50-50 uh, gender uh, balance on, on boards and I think COVID has highlighted especially the effects on the BAME community and make sure they're represented in, in positions of power. Uh, I mean that that doesn't take away the challenge that we face. Uh, the numbers in the NHS have been quite low in the past but I think the encouraging, uh, the encouraging change from the leadership programmes is that in the last three years the number of uh, people who register as BAME in chief executive posts has more than doubled in the last three years and is increasing at a faster rate than ever before in the last uh, 12 months. In terms of non-executive director appointments to NHS Trust, uh, there's four times as many uh, non-executive directors who have registered from the BAME uh, than, than, uh, uh, than before. But that doesn't take away the need to keep this high up on the agendas. From a trust point of view, when we when we go out for appointments, we uh, for the recent non-executive appointments, we specifically uh, encourage people welcomed applications from uh, those communities. Uh, but it is a challenge. Let's not get away. It it, it is a challenge, uh, and it's something that we need to keep our attention on in future years. OK, thank you. Thank you for that, Daniel. Apologies, you couldn't see Daniel speaking then. I'm afraid you've had to watch my face as I listen to him. So thank you for your contribution, Daniel. Um, if you're listening to this and you do come from a from a BAME background or you know somebody that, that would be um, a great governor, then absolutely make sure and encourage them to, to get involved and to take part. Right, I'm going to try and do a couple of quick ones now, if that's OK. So um, Michael Smiley, this one's for you. The annual report for North Cumbria Integrated Care mentions improvements to community hospitals during the year in line with the recommendations of the success regime. Can you tell us a little bit more about it, please? Michael, I can't hear you. I don't know if you're on mute. 
I think we're struggling to get to Michael, so we'll maybe come back to that question later on. Anna, I have a quick one for you, if that's OK. And it's a question from Margaret about using alternative and complementary therapies in the NHS. Hi, thanks, Julie, and thank you, Margaret. Um, what, I could say, what I would like to say really is that it's actually quite a broad question. And the answer is that in some services, yes, complementary therapies are used. However, there has to be an evidence base behind this and it has to be signed off through um, ethics panels. Um, and it has to be proven that it's safe and effective to do so. So yes, they are used in some services, but there is a um, strict criteria and process before we will be bringing anything in. That's great. Thank you very much, Anna. I'm going to nip to um, some of the questions that we've been asked. I think this one might be for you as well, Anna. So to give you warning, it's come from Glenn Turp from the Royal College of Nursing. And it's about the national shortage of registered nurses and increased patient dependency. So how are you working to ensure that patients get safe and effective care and also to make sure that the health and well-being of staff is looked after as well? Thanks, Anna. So I'll talk about the um, nurse staffing at the moment. We have a very robust system in the acute trust for monitoring our staffing levels um, on a daily basis. Um, we use a system called eRoster, which is a roster system for nurses, which clearly shows um, how many nurses should be rostered based on the size and the, um, the demands of the ward. Alongside that, there is a module called Safe Care, which actually looks at um, data that's inputted live during the day by our ward managers on the acuity of the patients and our matrons on a daily basis um, review that data and will move staff around to um, compensate where there are patients with higher acuity or they're unwell um, compared to other areas. We do have a, a fairly significant nurse staffing vacancy within the trust um, but we are offsetting that with um, over 100 um, framework agency nurses to make sure that our wards and departments are safe. These are valued members of our team and with, they're not just coming on an ad hoc basis. These nurses are given um, significant contracts so that they know that they're with us for a period of time. They're given the appropriate training. Um, so. We are um, also at the process of starting our international recruitment journey, which we had hoped to start earlier this year, but with the advent of COVID, that stopped um, people getting on planes and coming into the country. But we've restarted that and hope to um, receive our first tranche of nurses um, in January, who will then go through the national OSCE process, but come to us and work in Carlisle and Whitehaven. From a staff Anna, what's an OSCE process? Oh, an OSCE process is, sorry, um, so an OSCE is the exam that the nurses have to sit so that they can join the nursing register in England. So they have to prove that they can um, read and write in English and um, there's various um, exams that they have to sit. And that means that they are then um, entered onto the nursing register for the uh, Nursing and Midwifery Council and they've reached the required standard as, as our nurses have to do in this country. From a health and wellbeing perspective, the Trust take this really seriously. And actually recently we've just done a festival of health and wellbeing, which has been um, absolutely fantastic. And the staff, this was partly to thank the staff for all that they did in the, um, in the pandemic and to, um, and to support them moving forward into what we know is going to be a really difficult winter. So there was over 2000 water bottles given out just like this so staff can stay hydrated on the wards. Um, we had um, Thanksgiving events um, and we regularly encourage our staff to access um, um, support through the of free online support services that are available through the trust and I think I've probably said enough Julie. Thank you Anna. I think there's a page on the staff website as well which directs people to sources of health and wellbeing support which it's always worth 
being aware of. Um, Michael Smiley, I hope that we can come to you next if I can just ask you about the work in our community hospitals. Thank you, Julie. Can you hear me now? Great. Um, so the last 24 months have been really exciting as in that time we've been able to take forward two major refurbishments and extensions at uh, some of our community hospitals. I mean, we continue to develop clinic and site bases at all the hospitals, uh, but both Keswick and Brampton have increased their bed numbers and improved their facilities. Um, they've, they've got really excellent design facilities and a staff uh, who work in them day to day say that it really improves the quality of care that they can deliver. Um, I've been able to go to the sites and speak with staff and you know, I get a real feel for that in, in improved quality of care. It's a delight to see these well loved places, you know, have the investment that, that we planned for and promised. Um, in terms of uh, the, the improvements made, they wouldn't have been possible at the extent we have done without the generous support of the hospital leagues of friends in both those places. And, and we work with the leagues of friends for all the hospitals as well. Um, I, I met the leagues of friends. I'm actually really humbled by their tenacity, their big hearted support for our community hospitals. Uh, it's a real testament to the strong communities we have and the community's appreciation for these local services. So, you know, I, I want to place on record actually that, you know, we really appreciate their, their continued support and we'll continue working with them really closely. Um, you know, a big thank you to our leagues of friends. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, Peter Rooney, I'm, ju I'm just going to ask you really quickly. We spent a lot of time in North Cumbria talking about the success regime um, and we're, we're, we're kind of almost past the final hurdle with that really, aren't we? If you just want to tell us where we're up to. Thank you. Um, no, we have. We, we obviously concluded the public consultation some time ago and all of the actions arising from the consultation have, have largely been delivered, including the, the very encouraging ones that Michael just described in terms of the continued improvement and investment in community hospitals. But there are still there are, there are still some work to do to continue to invest in the other hospitals that, that community hospitals that require it. Um, and linked to that, there's also the, the long term intention around continuing to invest in West Cumberland Hospital, the local cancer centre and so on. And we've been really pleased to be able to conclude the, the actions from the success regime and the public consultation and those longer term capital investments for the benefit of everyone who, who lives and works here. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm probably going to come to you for this next question as well. It's come from Kate Gilman Brundett, who is a director of the studio at Moreland. Um, she runs an arts and wellbeing venue uh, near Penrith. They do lots of activities supporting wellbeing, particularly alleviating isolation, isolation being one of the biggest impacts on health. Her question is around as we move into winter and the next phase of COVID, we know that there's significant concern and prospect of more isolation within our communities. How, uh, how is the NHS going to support the organisations that help with wellbeing? So Peter, if you can come to you first and then I'm going to come to John as well, if that's OK. Well, a, a general thank you for all the fantastic work actually that, that all across Cumbria happens through the bond sector and local community groups. Um, it's something that we should all be proud of living and working in this county, the level of civic engagement, volunteering and support for groups of that nature. So, so thank you very much. Really important part of the fabric of local communities. Um, we recognise that often those groups are run on a shoestring and that some small investment would really help them to do, keep up the great work they do and do more of that work. So we were able to agree with Cumbria County Council um, an additional local grant scheme for community organisations and, and local charities, which people can apply for through the Cumbria Community Foundation. So that, that's our key way that we've offered some immediate support and we continue to be in discussion with our regional partners about how we can continue to build that, that approach and potentially make further investments in the future. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, John Rush, uh, I know that you uh, have talked about the work with bringing organisations together. Um, is this something that you'd want to talk to Kate about? I think with the, the thing around the community groups, uh, which obviously appears to be what, what Kate's operating and building on what Peter said, is that the um, I think what people want who are running these types of uh, operation or activities is they want connectivity, not just the funding, they want connectivity to us in, in, uh, within either the NHS or within social care 
or with other bigger third sector organisations. And sometimes the way to do that is through integrated care communities, as we talked about earlier on, and that's where we're trying to build that connectivity. Um, and whenever I've been to, to places like this, indeed, I, I run one myself in the village hall, uh, not, not as good as this, I would have to say, but certainly, you know, trying to achieve some of these things, is that actually, it's that, it's that recognition of what they do and then the connectivity. So, I mean, I, I can quite easily get in touch with Kate, and I know we have our health partnerships officer with Claire Edwards, who works with us and bridges across the sector and community organisations. I'm sure we'll be able to get some connectivity into the ICC and the local system there around Eden. Thank you very much, John. Kate, we'll, we'll follow that up with you. Um, I'm going to go to a couple of the questions that have been asked on the screen. So, Ramona, I think this one's probably coming to you. Um, it's from Mahesh Debar, who is a former consultant with the hospital, but also a, a very big um, uh, support from our public engagement point of view. Uh, Mahesh is asking a concern about public participation and a feeling that COVID-19 is being used to force through changes. I suspect he means without going through proper processes there. So if you could just explain a little bit about some of the changes that we've had and, and our commitment to the community. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Mahesh, for that question. And I think there's a, a quite a few things to say within that in terms of our services and the shape of some of the changes we've had to make to accommodate the pandemic, certainly in, in wave one. I think what's really important is I know lots of um, NHS organisations across the country made quite radical changes to uh, how individual sites were working, whether or not they continue to uh, receive, for example, uh, all elective care. Um, patients when we started to get that back up and running and actually we tried to maintain where we could um, continue with local service footprints across Whitehaven and indeed Carlisle so we didn't make any major changes to what each of our hospital areas in particular uh, were receiving and certainly undertaking in terms of service provision. Obviously we had the national requirements around um, not carrying out any elective operation during that time as well. So I think that's really important to, to give that clarity around what we did do during wave one around the COVID um, pandemic and how that shaped us taking forward. We have had a really good session with our overview and scrutiny colleagues just a few weeks ago about the learning from the pandemic and what that means for us looking forward in terms of shaping services. And that's very much how we involve our local communities, the work that we've continued to support through our um, West Cumbria and East Cumbria community forums around the, the change in shape of services and what that means for us potentially in the future. But I think just to give that reassuring message around where we are now, where we have been with that pandemic and actually we haven't made significant long term changes to, to any of our services actually, in fact, quite the opposite, we've tried to really adapt uh, that local provision of services. Technology, I think, as we heard at the start of the session, has really helped and supported some of that, I have to say, and we do need to build on that for the future. But absolutely, we're continuing in terms of that local engagement around how we develop services um, for the future and how we expand on some of that great learning across those pathways uh, that we've seen certainly through the first pandemic and indeed how that's shaping our thinking going into winter and how we plan for those scenarios around surge and increased pressure and demand as well. I'm not sure if that, Julie, please come back if that doesn't cover uh, all aspects uh, of it. I heard quite a good commitment to um, maintaining that involvement of our community when we're making changes. Uh, I hope Mahesh is, is reassured and um, I know that Mahesh will keep us on our toes if he's not. So thank you for that. And thank you to everybody that takes the time to get involved in our community forums and our engagement work. It is massively important. Um, I'm going to stick with the theme of COVID. We had a, a question submitted beforehand about how we coped with and how we are coping with the, the second wave. So. How did we cope first time around? What have we learned? How are we coping um, as we go into the second wave? And I'm going to go to Michael for that, please. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, well, in, in North Cumbria, we haven't yet seen the scale of cases that exist in the wider northwest or northeast regional centres at the moment. But we are expecting an increase over the next few weeks and we've seen one over the last couple of weeks to some degree um, and obviously we're preparing accordingly. Uh, during the first peak the trust coped well on the whole. Um, all our covered admissions were accommodated and we were able to you know, deliver treatments. Our treatment outcomes compare well to national benchmarks and that's been really good for our clinicians growing their confidence and obviously helping them prepare for, for second peak. Um, our frontline colleagues and support staff have just been really amazing through all of this I have to say despite their 
been a lot of anxiety, you know, with everybody, uh, you know, having family members and, and obviously working in difficult circumstances. We've always has it, always had enough PPE, even at times if the makes and models of that PPE were changing, um, you know, the nation was importing supplies from all over the world. We had to keep pace with that. And obviously locally, we worked with social care and primary care, um, you know, and sometimes shared PPE if, if any of us needed to do so. So really good liaison. So um, it's really important the population observes all the advice and rules so that we don't become overwhelmed as an NHS. Uh, we're currently delivering about three quarters or thereabouts of the elective treatments each week that we were before the pandemic. So that's quite a good restoration of services. Obviously, we want to build on that. And uh, as we can do um, as things proceed, uh, we'll seek to build on that as much as we can. Um, if numbers of COVID cases go up and hospital cases go up, etc., that could restrict that. So that's the thing we're trying to avoid uh, to prevent further delays delays to people's treatment. So um, we're really conscious of the need to support our staff all the time. Uh, we've expanded our PPE support. We've got more training for staff for mask wearing, those sorts of things, and uh, an extended occupational health service for staff, etc. working closely with our unions too. So um, all our staff have risk assessments in place, which we review, etc. I guess the biggest challenge we face as a trust looking ahead is the need to treat people who become unwell with COVID during the winter season, on top of usual rises in hospital missions, whilst also delivering the elective treatments. And so the key for us is ensuring people return you know, successfully to a non-hospital setting once they're better. And that helps us keep the hospital free for, for cases as they come in. So you know, those are the sorts of challenges we face and we're all working towards uh, as we look ahead. Um, it's probably worth just saying you know, on record really that um, what, what a generous mm. and heartwarming support we've seen from the public locally and nationally. It's, re it's really um, you know, incredibly humbling to see that. and. Um, reassuring for our staff it really does make a difference you know face the toughest challenges throughout this pandemic and they've been absolutely amazing so uh, just a big thank you to the public for ongoing support and of course we just stand in awe of our frontline staff across all the public services and the nhs services especially thank you michael and and people uh, watching this won't be able to see everybody else's faces who all started nodding when we said thank you for the community support that has been a, a huge benefit for, for our local NHS services. Helen, um, equally primary care frontline, 90% of contacts around the health service are through the front door of a GP. Um, how are you coping with COVID and winter pressures? Um, so thanks for the question. It's a really important one, I think. Um, I would just firstly want to echo what Michael said. I am in awe of my colleagues in the front line in general practice. Everybody has stepped up and made changes and adapted to what is an incredibly difficult situation and continues to be. And they're doing it with with grace, dignity and skill. So um, they're, they're fantastic. But I think the key thing is that um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, general practice changed quite dramatically how it worked. Uh, you may have seen in the, the media and you may have seen um, some people think that general practice is closed. General practice has never been closed, but we have changed how, how patients can um, approach and can access general practice. So very rapidly at the start of the pandemic, we changed from uh, patients being able to book without triage to everybody being triaged before they attended general practice. So in most practices that involves telephone contact with the surgery or with a clinician before they attend. If a patient needs to attend, then we have set systems up so patients can come in and be seen face to face if that's necessary. But there's an awfully large proportion of what we see in general practice that can be dealt with through remote uh, remote. Uh, technologies such as telephone, such as video consultations or online consultation, which is using email to, to ask, ask doctors questions. So we very quickly adapted to that to help support to keep primary care. Um, the GP practice is what we call green, so as COVID free as possible. Um, all of the PCNs set up red centres, which were centres for patients with COVID symptoms or other symptoms, but they also had COVID as well. So this allowed us to keep primary care very clean for patients who were in the high risk groups or for other patients who were non COVID related. And we had local staff, we had GPs and nurses and nurse practitioners from the, from the local surgeries staffing those those red centres and they continue on now and they're uh, they're well aware of the second wave coming and they are ramping up their uh, availability to help cope with that. Um, obviously, as we talked about earlier, we use new technology, so we're, we're using a lot more video and online consulting um, and a lot more telephone consulting. Um, and we're basically just continuing in that vein for the moment, which will help us get through the winter and, and, the, and the second wave. Um, plea that I would have a second what Michael said about following government, government and health 
protection advice about hand washing, mask wearing, keeping distance, please get your flu jab because that will help reduce the, 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 the flu burden on the health service and for the individuals over the winter. Um, and the other plea is just general practice is just like any other business. We are also having staff shortages um, with people having to isolate from COVID or have COVID symptoms themselves. But because we're often quite small businesses, this can often seem quite uh, quite more acute. We don't have the staff to cover. So please be patient with us if, if your prescriptions take a little bit longer or accessing takes a little bit longer. But general practice is open and we are available to see and speak to people as needed. Thank you, Helen. Right, I'm going to do some quick fire questions because we're, we're running out of time here. I'm going to start with one from Les Hanley, which asks about the demolition at West Cumberland Hospital. When will reconstruction commence and will services which have been transferred to the Cumberland Infirmary go back to West Cumberland? Michael, two lines quickly, please. Um, we're expecting to take forward building works over the next few months, starting in earnest on the bigger building works in May next year. Um, in terms of restoration of services, we're looking to bring services back to Cumbria, not just to West Cumbria, but back to Cumbria in Whitehaven with an increased degree of non-complex surgery taking part on that site. So it, briefly, that was uh, the, the brief answer. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for keeping it brief. Um, Ramona, I'm going to come to you with a quick question about the local cancer centre. Alan's asked if we're talking about Carlisle or on both major sites, if you could just explain the work that's underway and, and the progress that we're making with it. We're making significant progress, um, Julie, in terms of getting the centre uh, ready to be fully operational, working very closely with our colleagues in, in Newcastle. I think what's really important is whilst the Cancer Centre is placed in, in Carlisle. This absolutely is for our, all of our population in North Cumbria in terms of cancer care and treatment. Thank you. That, also, that, was, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Carol Woodman's asked a question about long COVID. Um, I'm going to ask Helen as the clinician that we've got with us um, just about our awareness of it and thinking about how we're starting to treat it. It might be that we need to come back to you, Carol. Um, so yeah, so we are aware of long COVID. We are starting to see a little bit more um, symptoms uh, happening, uh, fatigue being one of the key ones, some respiratory symptoms. So there is work ongoing within the CCG, within Trust, about looking at how we get services to support long COVID sy symptoms, but it is something that we are aware of. That's great. Thank you very much. Now, I, I am very conscious of time and I know that we've focused a lot on what's happened 2019, 2020, which you, you would expect for an annual general meeting and quite a lot on COVID as well. I just want to bring in two people at the end to kind of talk about our hopes for the years ahead. So first of all, our accountable officer for NHS North Cumbria, CCG, Mark Adams. Thank you, Julie. Um, first thing I'd like to say is, is just to reiterate all the thanks. Thanks to all of the people who work in our care, health, voluntary community sector organisations um, in the way that they have risen to the challenge of COVID. Um, but especially also our thanks to all of our people that we serve and our communities in the way that they have played their part and supported us all uh, in our efforts to, to deal with the pandemic. Um, I think that it's uh, a tribute to, to everybody involved, um, including our communities, and I think that that makes us very well placed to deal with what we have seen in terms of the, the increases in COVID recently. Um, but also in dealing with the, the normal winter seasonal illness that, uh, that we expect to see at this time of year. Um, looking forward, um, you know, one of the very key elements of the way that we've dealt with that um, has been the way that organisations, groups, teams, individuals across all of our organisations, voluntary community sector as well, um, have come together to, to rise to that challenge. Um, and I think it's that kind of way of working, that kind of partnership, that kind of collaboration um, that also makes us um, optimistic and well placed to think about how we continue to deal with some of the service challenges that we had before COVID um, and continue to try and uh, uh, continue to develop and transform services uh, and all of the things that we wanted to do before COVID. So I think I do look forward with a good degree of optimism. Um, we've got fantastic people working in our organisations. We've got great support from our communities and we want to continue to lever that um, to continue to develop services going forward. Thanks, Thank you Julie. very much, Mark Adams. And a uh, final word to Lynn Simpson, Chief Executive at North Cumbria Integrated Care NHS Foundation Trust. Thank you, Julie. So um, a couple of points from me. It's been really fascinating to reflect back on the year that's gone, but importantly, um, it's it's equally 
of value to us to think about the, the year ahead. There are a few things I would just say. So integration, participation, collaboration are all words that we use quite loosely, uh, but it does mean about how we continue to work together and to build things as a system together for um, the uh, residents of Cumbria. Alongside that, I'd like to say a few parochial issues there around the organisation. I would want to see us building on the principles of being a clinically led and a clinically engaged organisation. That's really about driving patient safety and patient quality. And as part of that, I'd want every patient experience to be a positive patient experience. Whether you ring up and ask a question over the telephone, whether you attend to see a patient in the hospital, whether you go into a community service and have a contact with a health visitor or a district nurse, every experience should be a positive one because then you carry those messages out to the general public. Sitting alongside that, I want our staff to have a good experience when they come to work. I want them to enjoy coming to work. I want them to feel enthusiastic about the work that they do because they do fantastic work. But again, that builds a level of confidence in the organisation. So in summary, I want to do all of the, the good things around the partnership. I want to encourage everyone who works in the system to have a good experience. But most of all, I want patients to have a good quality, safe experience in the year ahead. Thank you very much, Lynn. I think they sound uh, something that everybody can get behind. I hope today has been helpful. I'd like to thank everyone that's given up their time either to answer questions or especially to ask questions and to listen. And if you're listening to this or watching it on a, on a catch up uh, platform, thank you for taking the time to to care about your health system and to want to know what's happening. Thank you too for all of the, the kind words and thoughts and the clap for carers every week. It really did make a difference to our frontline staff. Um, it, it was only a little thing, but it, it was a massive thing to know that people had that support. And if you would like to keep on supporting your NHS, hands, face, space, keep washing your hands, keep following that distance and wear coverings where we're supposed to. Get your flu jab if you're eligible. I know people may have had to wait a little while this year. You can also join up to be a member of the Trust if you haven't already. And most importantly of all, please remember that our NHS is very, very much open. It's here for you. If you need help, please come and ask for it. It might look and feel a bit different, but we're here to look after people. I'd like to thank everyone. I hope it's been helpful. Thank you and goodbye.